All right. Um, as I studied this text, um, I spent, you know, when we prepare for these messages, we, we have the, the things that we're planning to talk about each week, but we don't really know when we start studying where God's going to lead us. Um, we don't go into these with, you know, we know we're going to teach that. And we know we're going to teach that. Really, each week, we, we come into these texts and we're, we study and we read commentaries and then we, we pray. We sit and we wait, and it's, it's a hard part of doing this. And so as I was preparing for this, I was asking God to show me what thought or idea that I should highlight in this text. And the word names, names, is the thing that he kept placing in my mind. In Genesis 10, there's a list of all the noteworthy descendants of Noah and his sons, which are the founding father of the world, uh, the founding family of the world, mixed together with the names of their territories, in Genesis 11, 1 through 11, uh, this is the naming of a region and a city, and most notably, it's a group of people who decides to try to fashion a name for themselves. And then in, uh, in verses 12 through 16, it's the reiteration and introduction of a set of names that God is beginning to pull out from the other names and highlight on their own. My aim tonight is that each of us would clearly see who God says we are and that we would embrace and engage those names rather than rebel against them. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for this night. Thank you that we're here. Thank you for your word. Lord, thank you that uh, when we study your word and we take the time to listen and to pray, that something that we so many of us I know have just blown past. We think genealogies, skip it. And yet you've got things here for us that we need to know that will change us. Lord, that is your word. Every word of your word is intentional. Breathe from you. So let us, let us not be distracted. Holy Spirit, fill each of us. Uh, push out the distractions. Push me aside, Lord. Let me not be distracting. And help each of us hear what, what you want us to hear. So we'll walk out of here better men for you, Jesus, than the way we came in. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, there's, there's three key we are's that stand out in this passage. We are members of a global family. We are subject to God's authority. And we are, as believers, set apart for God's purpose. Section one is Genesis 10, which is the table of nations. And there's, I'm going to break it up into three parts. The key principle, again, is that we are members of a global family. So I'll start by explaining first how I arrived at this principle, and then I'll point out some key observations and takeaways within this. Part one of section one is we are members of a global family. In Genesis 7, it says this, and it's talking about the flood. It states, everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. The Bible makes it incredibly clear that when the flood hit, it was not a local flood, as some theorists propose. It was a global flood. And this global flood wiped out absolutely everything, every living thing on the face of the earth. The only creatures that survived were Noah, his family, and the animals that were with him. This text spells it out literally and clearly. Moving forward from there, we see in, in, in uh, Genesis 9 and then in 10, it says two similar things. In Genesis 9, he says, The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. These three were the sons of Noah and from these, the people of the whole earth were dispersed. And then it repeats again in verse 32 at the end of chapter 10. These are the clans of the sons of Noah, according to the, their genealogies in their nations. And from these, the nations spread abroad on the earth after the flood. The text, again, clearly and literally spells it out. All mankind is genetically related because we come from the same ancestral family as Noah and his sons. Therefore, we are members of a global family. Here's an observation. Uh, part two of this first section is that this global family is diverse. It's diverse. And where do, we, where do we read that? There's three times in this chapter. 
In verse 5, and this is talking about Japheth and his family, from these coastal peoples, from these the coastal peoples spread in their lands, each with his own language, by their clans, and in their nations. And then in verse 20, these are the sons of Ham, by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. And in verse 31, these are the sons of Shem, by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. It's repetitive. It's on purpose. From this foundational family, God wants us to see clearly that his plan from the beginning was for humankind to be a mixture of cultures and types of people. Why is this important? Diversity of humans, even those who don't believe or follow God, in God's providence, allows mankind to see a larger, more comprehensive picture of who he is. Mankind is truly a mosaic. A mosaic is a piece of art that's comprised of thousands of little tiles of all shapes and colors, and the combination of them culminates into something that is far greater than the individual pieces. And that's what God's highlighting here. In humanity, the mixture of all sorts of people culminates into a picture that displays what? Into a picture that displays who God himself is. And what do I mean? Here's some examples of how how this diversity points to God and who he is. Many skin tones, all created in God's image, show us that God the Father is not just a white guy. Many languages shows us that God is brilliant. He's able to understand and speak thousands of tongues and dialects. People opposed to God allows us to see God's justice and his ability to change even the hardest of hearts. People who are faithful to God allows us to see how abundantly he blesses those who obey him. The diversity of humankind allows us to more fully see the many aspects of God's person and his character which we would never experience if, God, if, if mankind was homogenous. Our global family is diverse. The third part of this first section is a takeaway, and that is that this entire family, this entire global family is valuable and intentional. And where do we find this principle in the text? It's signified in the 70 nations listed in this genealogy in chapter 10. All throughout the rest of scripture, the number 70 is used by God to show his care, his involvement, and his intentionality amidst his people. Here's a few examples. In Jeremiah 29, 10, it says, For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you, and I will fulfill my promise Fulfill fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. The people of Israel were living as exiles in Babylon. And God says, these 70 years of captivity are for a purpose that I have ordained. I've ordained it. And so don't worry, I've got you. You guys know the rest, the next verse, it says, I have a plan for you. I have a plan for you. These 70 years are on purpose. That number means that. In in Numbers 11, we see this again. Then the Lord said to Moses, gather for me 70 men of the elders of Israel, and I will come down, and I'll talk with you there. And I'll take some of the spirit that is on you and put it on them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with you so that you may not bear it yourself alone. Just can you feel the love of God in this moment. Moses is leading these people. They're not easy people to lead. And he wants them to know you're not leading them by yourself. I'm sending 70 men. I'm bringing 70 men to you, Moses, so that you will know I'm involved. I care, and I'm here to help you. God intentionally lists 70 nations in Genesis 10 to emphasize that even with the fighting, brokenness, and things he know will oppose him, there is great value in this composition that he's created. It's valuable. Keep this in mind as you think about these 70 nations. All people from these nations, obedient and disobedient, from which all of us have come, are still created in God's image, and our children who God loves. They're his kids. He still loves them, regardless of how obedient they are to him. When we look at this list of names, 
Certainly when I look at this list of names, I think a lot of us automatically start to sort good names, bad names, good names, bad names, right? Like there's a good tribe, there's a bad tribe. But when God looks at this list, he's looking at it on the whole and he's saying, I approve of this list. I approve of all of it. You know, just the other day, uh, I was in the midst of, midst of working on this lecture and my wife and I are driving down, to, uh, going to downtown Indy uh, to have a little date together. And as we're driving down the road, I see this guy with a big old belly and he's walking down the road and he's got his shirt off. And my, my, gut, my gut reaction, uh, <laughs> it was a gut reaction, uh, sorry about that, um, was, was to judge him was to look down on him, was to devalue him. I think my exact words of my wife was, well, there's a special guy. And, you know, in that moment, it was, it was cool. I, I felt more blessed by God than judged. I felt this burst of grace, and the Lord reminded me of this text. And he was showing me that that voice of judgment is the one he's trying to combat with this text. By recording specifically 70 nations, he's reminding us, I made this. I made all of it. I care about all these people. All of this, I know you think it's bad and it looks bad, but I still made it all and it's on purpose. It's on purpose. And so what is the call to action then? It's this, when you, when you walk around, as you live your life, who do you find yourself looking down upon? Is this someone of another race? Is it someone who speaks a different language? Is it someone who doesn't believe in Jesus? Are you looking down on them? The calling for us as believers is to say in our hearts, I may not know or see the purpose that God has for that person, but God made them on purpose for a purpose. And I need to love and value them because God himself does. We're a global family. What needs to change in your heart towards the members of this family who you don't understand or don't agree with so that you can value them the way God does and you can truly love them? The second part of this text is Genesis 11, 1 through 11. It's the Tower of Babel. And the key principle is that we are subject to God's authority. And we see this idea played out in its fullness in this, uh, with, with Nimrod and the city of Babel. Now, Britannica states that authority, we're talking about we are subject to God's authority. Authority is the power or right to direct or control someone or something. We all, as, as creatures who God himself created on a planet which he created, are ultimately subject to his control. Isaiah 46 says this so well. It's God speaking, and he says, remember this. And stand firm, recall it to mind, you transgressors. For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there's none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purposes. I have spoken, and I will bring it to pass. I have purpose, and I will do it. What we find in this story is that the people of Babel are making it clear that we are not going to willingly submit to God and to his authority. God explicitly stated in Genesis 1 and then reiterates to Noah and his sons twice in Genesis 9 that mankind was supposed to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Now, when you heard the statement, we are subject to God's authority, uh, a question may have arisen within you, and it's one that's been asked for thousands of years, and it's that, how can we have free will and God still have complete authority over us? How can that be? And I can't explain it better than how God depicts it here in this, in this chapter of Genesis. He does a pretty good job. In the story of the city of Babel, we see God allowing these people, led by Nimrod, to choose the path of pride. They make it abundantly clear in their actions and with their words. We do not want or need God. We will dictate who we are, and we will decide what we're going to do, not God. 
And for a time, God allows them to live in those decisions until it becomes clear that they aren't going to change and it's going to conflict with his clearly stated objectives. They have been playing, they've been playing a game of make-believe, deceiving themselves, believing that because God had given them authority over some parts of their lives, that they had the power to control all parts of their lives. And what's the result when this happens in Babel? I I love this part. It, It says that God came down to see the tower that the children of man had made. They, they, they were so proud of this tower, right? It was, Kyle came up with this idea. I'm taking his idea. I just loved his thought. It was, there's these kids. It's like, they're coming down to see what the kids did, you know? What the kids do? And they're built, we stole all the way to the heavens. And he's like, guys, it's not to the heavens. And he, he forces this, cha- this change by his authority. And they don't have any, they don't have any choice. And that change mandates the fulfillment of his will and alters their life in such a way that it would become very difficult for them to live their lives without relying on God. God is merciful in this moment. He's merciful in exercising his authority. He turns their lives upside down so that maybe, just maybe, they'll choose to obey and yield to his authority rather than fighting it. Proverbs 19.21 says, Many are the plans... In the, man, in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. We as humans are given the ability to think and plan and make choices. But at the same time, whatever our plans are, if they circumvent God or they're opposed to his plan, they will not stand. They will not stand. We are subject to God's authority. We are. In what areas of your life are you making plans that ignore God and put you or your desires at the center? The final section is uh, verses 12 through 26. It's the line of Shem. And the key principle is that we as Christians are set apart for God's purpose. We're set apart for his purpose. When we look back at these two chapters, if you, if you observe closely the progression, starting with, with chapter 10 and then work to the end of 11, there's a clear intentionality in the sequence of the writings. So if you follow them through and really pay attention to the sequence, God's doing something here. So in chapter 10, he's listing the whole founding family, and he's emphasizing the value of the importance as a whole and, and, and his relation to his plan for the world. And then And then in the opening of chapter 11, there's this stark reminder that we've just talked about that the new population of the world has once again begun to cast God aside and chase the evil within their hearts. And so you start to wonder, what's what's God going to do next? What's he have to do next? And then there's this sudden shift that feels like it's almost out of place. And we're back into a genealogy. And you're like, oh, we just got out of a genealogy. And we're back into it again. And, and he wants you to ask, like, why are we doing the genealogy again? God, we just, we just got through that. And that's the point he's hoping you'll ask. Why are we focusing on Shem now? What we see unfolding in the very fabric of the text is the point of the text itself. Deuteronomy 7.6 says, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. To be made holy literally means to be set apart for the service of God. Genesis 11, 12 through 26 is the beginning of the setting apart, the making holy of the line of Shem that we will see played out all throughout the remainder of scripture. God is signaling that this group, the line of Shem, is going to be used by him, for him, and in service of him. So what does this mean for us as Christians, as followers of Christ who may not be from the line of Shem? Galatians 3 says, this is the Apostle Paul writing to Gentile Christians, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Then he says a few more things that are important, but this is the important part at the end. It says, and if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. And then Uh, Peter says this so well. He says, but you are a chosen race. He's talking to Christians, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people people for his own possession, that, 
That what? That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The message of both these apostles is that for those who have accepted Christ, we too have been set apart, made holy for God's purpose. And what is that purpose? Why did God choose the line of Shem and eventually us to be the people through which he would tell his story? If we look ahead at scripture, we see that the Israelites and the, and the founding fathers of our faith were not the perfect picture of righteousness and goodness and purity and godliness. They were a mess. They were a pendulum of faithfulness and disobedience. They were rife with mistakes and idol worship and turning their backs on God intermixed with moments of corporate and individual faithfulness. The story of the Shemites, Israel, our story, has been selected and set apart by God to show not how great we are, but how great God is in the midst of our stumbling through our relationship with him. So the question is, how committed are you to being used for this purpose? And what will win the hearts of people when they see your story? Will it be how great and righteous you are? Or will it be how great and loving God is in the midst of your victories and especially your failures? What will speak to their hearts? We are set apart for God's purpose. What needs to change in your life so that the non-believers around you can hear your real story, failures and successes, so that they will see God's true power, love, justice, and majesty through you? What needs to change so they can see the real thing? In conclusion and in summary, God makes it clear through his word who he says we are. We're members of a global family. We're subject to God's authority. We're set apart for God's purpose. And here's a closing thought I hope you guys will think about as you leave here. What if Nimrod, with all his ambition, had used that ambition towards embracing and living out God's will for him and for mankind? The mighty warrior who built cities and empires the mighty warrior loving, valuing, and embracing the nations and the people who were different than him. The mighty warrior yielding to God's authority, calling out to Yahweh and saying, God, what, what, what land will we take dominion over and fill with your majesty today? The mighty warrior living a holy life set apart for God's purposes, allowing his faith and his failures to show his neighbors and the nations that God is good, loving, faithful, just, and able to save even the most prideful and arrogant souls that have ever lived. Men, it's too late for Nimrod, but it's the right time for us. It's the right time for us. So let us be the men who God says we are starting tonight. Let us be those men. Let's pray together. God, I, I do pray that you would make these things come alive in us. Teach us to love and value those who we don't understand or don't agree with. Lord, embolden us to let go of control and submit our lives to your leadership and goodness. Let us live lives that are worthy of the purpose that you've set us apart for, not, not being Pharisees, Lord, not somehow thinking that our perfection is what will draw people to us. It's that your work in us, through us, and in all that we are, that's what will bring people to us. Lord, let us not hide behind the superficial. Let us be real, Lord. Let us be the men who you say we are, Lord. Let us be the men you say we are. Let that be the name that we, that we carry. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.